welcome to Snoozecast, a podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On Snoozecast, we read excerpts from public domain works and occasionally original stories. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please review us on Apple Podcasts and also share it with a friend. The best place to listen to us is on our website, snoozecast.com. That way, you can play a single episode and fall asleep without another one automatically playing. This episode is brought to you by Knowing the Moon and Stars Are Up There, Even When You Can't See Them. Tonight, I'll be reading the classic children's story Heidi, published in 1881 by Swiss author Johanna Spiri. It's a novel about the life of a young girl in her grandfather's care in the Swiss Alps. Heidi is one of the best-selling books ever written and is among the best-known works of Swiss literature. get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Chapter 1. Heidi's First Mountain Climb On a bright June morning, two figures, one a tall girl and the other a child, could be seen climbing a narrow mountain path that winds up from the pretty village of Mayenfeld to the lofty heights of the Alm Mountain. In spite of the hot June sun, the child was clothed as if to keep off the bitterest frost. She did not look more than five years old, but what her natural figure was like would be hard to say, for she had on apparently two dresses, one above the other, and over these a thick red woolen shawl. Her small feet were shod in thick, nailed mountain shoes. When the wayfarers came to the hamlet known as Dorfli, which is situated halfway up the mountain, they met with greetings from all sides, for the elder girl was now in her old home. As they were leaving the village, a voice called out, Wait a moment, Deet. If you're going on up the mountain, I'll come along with you. The girl thus addressed stood still, and the child immediately let go of her hand and seated herself on the ground. Are you tired, Heidi? asked her companion. No, I am hot, answered the child. We shall soon get to the top now. You must walk bravely on a little longer and take good long steps, and in about another hour we shall be there, said Deet. They were now joined by a stout, good-natured looking woman who walked on ahead with her old acquaintance. "'And where are you going with the child?' asked the one who had just joined the party. "'I suppose it is the child your sister left?' "'Yes,' answered Deet. "'I am taking her up to Uncle, where she must stay.' "'This child stay up there with all, Uncle. "'You must be out of your senses, Deet. "'How can you think of such a thing? "'The old man, however, will soon send you both packing off home again. He cannot very well do that, seeing that he is her grandfather. He must do something for her. I have had the charge of the child till now, and I can tell you, Barbell, I am not going to give up the chance which has just fallen to me of getting a good place for her sake. That would be all very well if he were like other people, said Barbell, 
But you know what he is, and what can he do with a child, especially with one so young? The child cannot possibly live with him. But where are you thinking of going yourself? To Frankfurt, where an extra good place awaits me, answered Diet. I am glad I am not the child, exclaimed Barbel. Not a creature knows anything about the old man up there. He will have nothing to do with anybody, and never sets his foot inside a church from one year's end to another. When he does come down once in a while, everybody clears out of his way. The mere sight of him, with his bushy, gray eyebrows and immense beard, is alarming enough. All kinds of things are said about him. You, Deet, however, must certainly have learnt a good deal concerning him from your sister. Yes, but I'm not going to repeat what I heard. Suppose it should come to his ears. I should get into no end of trouble about it. Barbel put her arm through Deet's in a confidential sort of way and said, Now, do just tell me what is wrong with the old man. Was he always shunned as he is now? And was he always so cross? I assure you, I'll hold my tongue if you'll tell me. Very well, then, I'll tell you. But just wait a moment, said Deet, looking around for Heidi, who had slipped away unnoticed. I see where she is, exclaimed Barbel. Look over there and she pointed to a spot far away from the footpath. She's climbing up the slope yonder with Peter and his goats. But tell me about the old man. Did he ever have anything more than his two goats in his hut? Oh, I, sh I should think so, indeed, replied Deet with animation. He was at one time the owner of one of the largest farms in Domsleg, where my mother used to live. But he drank and gambled away the whole of his property, and when this became known to his mother and father, they died of sorrow, one shortly after the other. Uncle, having nothing left to him but his bad name, disappeared, and it was heard that he had gone to Naples as a soldier. After twelve or fifteen years, he reappeared in Domschleg, bringing with him a young son whom he tried to place with some of his kinspeople. Every door, however, was shut in his face, for no one wished to have any more to do with him. Embittered by this treatment, he vowed never to set foot in Domschleg again, and he then came to Dorfli, where he lived with his little boy. His wife, it seemed, had died shortly after the child's birth. He must have accumulated some money during his absence, for he apprenticed his son Tobias to a carpenter. He was a steady lad and kindly received by everyone in Dorfley. His father, however, was still looked upon with suspicion, and it was even rumored that he had killed a man in some brawl in Naples. But why does everyone call him uncle? "'Surely he can't be uncle to everyone living in Dorfley,' asked Barbel. "'Our grandmothers were related, so we used to call him uncle, "'and as my father had family connections with so many people in Dorfley, "'soon everyone fell into the habit of calling him uncle,' explained Deet. "'And what happened to Tobias?' further questioned Barbel, "'who was listening with deep interest.' Tobias was taught his trade in Mel's, and when he had served his apprenticeship, he came back to Dorfley and married my sister, Adelaide. But their happiness did not last long. Two years after their marriage, Tobias was killed in an accident. His wife was so overcome with grief that she fell into a fever from which she never recovered. She had always been rather delicate and subject to curious attacks, during which no one knew whether she was awake or sleeping. And so two months after Tobias had been carried to the grave, his wife followed him. Their sad fate was the talk of everybody far and near, and the general opinion was expressed 
that it was punishment which uncle deserved for the godless life he had led. Our minister endeavored to awaken his conscience, but the old man grew only more wrathful and stubborn and would not speak to a soul. All at once we heard that he had gone to live up on the Alm Mountain and that he did not intend to come down again. Since then, he has led his solitary life up there, and everyone knows him now by the name of Alm Uncle. Mother and I took Adelaide's little one, then only a year old, into our care. When mother died last year, and I went down to the baths to earn some money, I paid old Ursel to take care of her. So you see, I have done my duty. Now it's uncle's turn. But where are you going to yourself, Barbell? We're now halfway up the alm. We've just reached the place I wanted, answered Barbell. I must see Peter's mother, who is doing some spinning for me. So, goodbye, Deet, and good luck to you. She went toward a small, dark brown hut, which stood a few steps away from the path in a hollow that afforded it some protection from the mountain wind. Here lived Peter, the eleven-year-old boy, with his mother, Brigitta, and his blind grandmother, who was known to all the old and young in the neighborhood as just grandmother. Every morning, Peter went down to Dorfley to bring up a flock of goats to browse on the mountain. At sundown, he went skipping down the mountain again with his light-footed animals. When he reached Dorfley, he would give a shrill whistle whereupon all the owners of the goats would come out to take home the animals that belonged to them. Deet had been standing for a good ten minutes, looking about her in every direction for some sign of the children and the goats. Meanwhile, Heidi and the goat herd were climbing up by a far and roundabout way, for Peter knew many spots where all kinds of good food in the shape of shrubs and plants, grew for his goats. The child, exhausted with the heat and weight of her thick clothes, panted and struggled after him, at first with some difficulty. She said nothing, but her little eyes kept watching first Peter as he sprang nimbly hither and thither on his bare feet, clad only in his short, light breeches and then the slim-legged goats that went leaping over rocks and shrubs. All at once she sat down on the ground and began pulling off her shoes and stockings. Then she unwound the hot red shawl and took off her frock. But there was still another to unfasten, for Deet had put the Sunday dress on over the everyday one to save the trouble of carrying it. Quick as lightning, the everyday frock followed the other, and now the child stood up, clad only in her light, short-sleeved undergarment. She stretched out her little bare arms with glee, leaving all her clothes together in a tidy little heap. She went jumping and climbing up after Peter and the goats as nimbly as any of the party. Now that Heidi was able to move at her ease, she began to enter into conversation with Peter. She asked him how many goats he had, where he was going to with them, and what he had to do when he arrived there. At last, after some time, they came within view of Deet. Hardly had the latter caught sight of the little company climbing up towards her when she shrieked out, Heidi, what have you been doing? What a sight you've made of yourself. And where are your two frocks and the red wrapper? And the new shoes I bought? And the new stockings I knitted for you? Everything's gone. Not a thing left. What can you have been thinking, Heidi? Where are all your clothes? The child quietly pointed to a spot below on the mountainside and answered, 
down there. You good-for-nothing little thing, exclaimed Deet angrily. What could have been put into your head to do that? What made you undress yourself? What do you mean by it? I don't want any clothes, said Heidi. Deet gave Peter money for fetching Heidi's clothes. You wretched, thoughtless child, have you no sense in you at all? Continued Deet, scolding and lamenting. Peter, you go down and fetch them for me as quickly as you can, and you shall have something nice. And she held out a bright new piece of money to him that sparkled in the sun. Peter was immediately off down the steep mountainside, taking the shortest cut, and was back again so quickly with the clothes that even Deet was obliged to give him a word of praise as she handed him the promised money. Peter promptly thrust it into his pocket, and his face beamed with delight, for it was not often that he was the happy possessor of such riches. You can carry the things up for me as far as uncle's, as you're going the same way, went on Deet, who was preparing to continue her climb up the mountainside, which rose in a steep ascent immediately behind the goat herd's hut. Peter willingly undertook to do this, and followed after her. After a climb of more than three quarters of an hour, they reached the top of the Alm Mountain. Uncle's hut stood on a projection of the rock, exposed indeed to the winds, but where every ray of sun could rest upon it, and a full view could be had of the valley beneath. Behind the hut, stood three old fir trees with long, thick, unlopped branches. Beyond these trees rose a further wall of mountain, the lower heights still overgrown with beautiful grass and plants. Against the hut on the side Looking toward the valley, Uncle had put up a seat. Here he was sitting, his pipe in his mouth, and his hands on his knees, quietly looking out when the children, the goats, and Deet suddenly clambered into view. Heidi was at the top first. She went straight up to the old man, put out her hand, and said, Good evening, grandfather. <laughs>